It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Stephen Davidowitz, DDS, a.k.a. Dr. D at Luxury Dentistry, New York City. He is the owner and practicing dentist at Luxury Dentistry in NYC, located in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. He's also the co-founder and serves as the director of dental services at MOD Mouth. Dr. Stephen received his DDS degree from the New York University College of Dentistry, uh, where 7% of all American dentists went, and completed a general dentistry residency at Brooklyn Hospital Medical Center. He did his fellowship training in implant surgery and restorative implant dentistry at New York University and is a fellow in the International Congress of Oral Implantology. Dr. Stephen practices general and cosmetic dentistry with a true love for smile makeover through clear liner and porcelain veneer treatment. He is also an active member in the American Academy of Clear Liners, in which he has published multiple, multiple articles on clear liner therapy and modalities, as well as being a member of the American Dental Association, the Academy of General Dentistry, and the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics. He was recently named a member of the Real Self Medical Review Advisory Board for Cosmetic Dentistry content on their website and platform at realself.com. Dr. Stephen has been invited to collaborate with other professionals as a contributor to the upcoming Smile Book, Creating Healthy and Beautiful Smiles with Cosmetic Dentistry. It is currently scheduled for release in early 2020. The book will offer expert information on cosmetic and restorative dentistry procedures. It is designed to be a book for dental patients that will allow them to access the latest information on how cosmetic dentistry can improve their lives. He's an elite 1% Invisalign doctor, currently one of only 20 25 nationally. He's a board member of an exclusive Invisalign team of treating dentists known as Rain Gauge. With over 100 hours of CE knowledge a year, he trains, mentors, and teaches Invisalign dentists across North America. Upon graduating from the University of Medicine and Dentistry in New York, um, he dedicated himself to providing uh, the best dentistry he can. But by, by the way, I'm not even halfway through his resume. But, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say this. True or false? Every time I meet some guy like you who's crushing it in cosmetic dentistry, they're always hot. They're always good looking. They look hot. You don't ever see somebody like me killing it in cosmetic dentistry, tummy tucks, facelifts, boob jobs. Is that a fair assessment? You're making me blush, Howard. I, I, <laughs> I'm not even sure how to respond to that. But, but it's uh, true. I mean, you wouldn't go to an aerobics instructor class if it was Danny DeVito smoking a cigar up there, would you? So... <laughs> I'll tell you what, in New York City, cutthroat, right? A cosmetic dentist, you call yourself a cosmetic dentist in New York City, you, you, you have to take care of yourself. You gotta, be, you gotta be young to start, and then you can start letting things go a little bit once you have that reputation. So I'm, I'm getting to that point where I think in a few more years, I could get my beer belly and start to let my beard grow and you know, and not worry too much. But at this point, I'm, I'm still, you know, focused on the, on the uh, looks matching the name. Well, I, I have to, the guys in Scottsdale that are killing it in women's, you know, tummy tucks and face jobs and all that kind of stuff, they're always hot. And then the Elmer Fudd across the street who might have, you know, graduated first in his class in physics, not, not doing too well. And the same thing with, with physical trainers. I mean, you wouldn't want to get a physical trainer that was uh, tough. Before we get started on all things cosmetic, um, I think it kind of is bizarre to me. It's October 14th. That's why I'm wearing orange. This is my Halloween costume. I, uh, uh, is the Greater New York Dental Meeting really going to be on? I mean, I mean, they canceled Hinman in March. I, they've already canceled the ADA meeting in Florida. And the Greater New York still, I, I've even called them. They're like, uh, we're, we're still on. And I'm like, come on, dude, you're from downtown New York. I know there, there's so much money involved with it that I think they're going to keep trying to make it happen. As we are going through this together and the, and the wave is going down in New York, but now it's on its uptick. I think it's going to coincide with our greater dental New York meeting. I cannot imagine. I mean, I, I could see the CE aspect going on and having that done in the right way, but to have those thousands and thousands of dentists and family or whatever it is walking around from booth to booth, I can't see it at this point with the projection of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense, but I mean, we're getting close. Cause that's always, it's the perfect meeting in the world because 
it's right after Thanksgiving. And the New York City, I mean, my God, if you go there and, you know, like, like greater New York has it, in, I mean, um, the Yankee has it in like February. I'm like, why don't you move the meeting to Antarctica? Um, you know, um, Chicago midwinter, Chicago in the spring, in the fall, it's perfect. But they always have it in February where, you know, the wind's coming off the, the Great Lakes. It's horrible. But New York's the only one. The only meeting I'm aware of, like even the big Cologne meeting has it in March in Germany, you know, that's up by Poland and Russia. 70% of Russia uh, would be in Canada if it was on in, in our deal. And New York's the only one smart enough to say, you know what the perfect weekend in New York is? Right after Thanksgiving, the weather's perfect. I mean, it's just the best meeting in the world simply because it's at the right time of the year. I totally agree. and. You know, obviously this year is an anomaly, but they, they had it down. I have colleagues and friends from school uh, traveling from across the country to come back to that meeting because it's a perfect time. They're off from work. They're able to bring their family. They go up to a nice hotel. The, the city is bustling and it's gorgeous at that time of year. Uh, and the weather is not so bad. Uh, it, it's usually great, uh, but this is, you know, an unprecedented year for us. And I, I, I cannot really imagine it going on or at least the way that I see it every year. And I, I will probably not attend uh, this year. Uh, I could say that with almost full certainty. So now you're in, um, you're right smack downtown. Were you born in Manhattan? Are you, you're in Manhattan. Were you born in Manhattan? Right. So the practice is actually uptown. It's, it's upper East side of Manhattan. Um, I was born in Brooklyn. I, I was born in Brooklyn and my monody's hospital. Uh, where a lot of my family was born, and that's where I, I grew up. Um, and then I spent some years in Manhattan, and I moved out, like most, uh, to greener pastures. And in New York, we call that Long Island. Uh, and that's where I'm living now with my beautiful family. Uh, I have two children, Eli and Lily, and my amazing wife, Shauna. Why didn't you just buy stock in Eli, Lily? instead of having two children and doing Eli and Lily? That's a awesome. Um, my gosh. Um, by, by the way, um, I always think it's so funny about New York City because every time I've ever lectured in another country, um, anybody that's come to America, they always run up to me and says, I've, I've visited your country. I went to your country. And I'm from Kansas. And I'm thinking, okay, where did you go? And they always say the same thing. The greater New York meeting. And I'm like, well, did did you leave New York? No, we were there the whole time. And I'm just sitting here thinking, God, the United States of America and they just have a vision of it that it's just New York City. And I'm like, okay, that's uh, not a very big sample size of America. But uh, I do love New York, and it is confusing for the international people because New Yorkers don't realize they do it. But um, whenever you talk to a New Yorker, nobody actually lives in New York City. Like, you'll, you'll look at Dennis and as I say, do you live in New York City? No, I live in Manhattan. I ask you, do you live in Manhattan? No. I live in northern Manhattan. Do you live in New York? No, I live in Brooklyn. But anyway, for around the world, um, it's just a tribal thing. They all live in New York City, but one-on-one, -on -one, no one lives in New York City. It's kind of kind of weird that way, isn't it? You got that right, Howard. That's the way it is. I personally, um, uh, you know, I got, um, I, I just want to say this. I don't like, I shouldn't even be the guy to interview you because I, um, I, I don't like cosmetic dentistry. I mean, when a pretty girl comes in and wants veneers, I mean, I want a toothache. I want somebody holding their face that didn't sleep last night. I, I want to pull out a wisdom teeth. I, I If I could just pull out teeth and do root canals, I'd live happily ever after. But when some girl comes in, and, and to me, this is how I see the market of my patient for 32 years. If they're young and beautiful, they don't need cosmetic dentistry. And if they think they do, they don't have any money. And if they're older, they just got divorced. They're now going back to get fixed up, to go on plenty of fish and tender and all that kind of stuff. And, and they really want to give you a bunch of money and look 20 years younger. And they're telling all this criteria. And, I'm, and I just want to say, ma'am, do, do you know you have a liver spot on your head? Uh, I, 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 I just, I, I mean, I, I run from those. What attracted you to people who want to look, 10, 20 years later, I, I'd run from that case, but I'd, I'd get a broken file out of an MB2 if it took me three hours. So there, there's a bunch of answers to that. Firstly, you know, what, what is it about dentistry, right? Why, why do we love it? At least you should love it. 
what is it about it that attracts the practitioner to want to get to that office every day? Some people will say money, but that, that shouldn't be the drive, right? It's not, it's not the money. It's to get somebody out of a discomfort and give them something that's going to make them feel better, right? So whether that's, I love doing root canals because somebody comes in with this abscess and they just want to kiss you and all of a sudden you, you do that IND and the pressure is gone and now they feel so good. They, they're, 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 they're in love with you and you love that feeling because you're, you're giving somebody back that feeling of normalcy. Cosmetic dentistry, I feel, gives somebody that feeling and it continues on and on and on and on, hopefully with good prevention and regular recalls, that feeling of, of just feeling of self-worth and, and whatever was bothering them that they were going crazy about in their head, that they're feeling good about, that, that same aspect, right? Whether it's an IND, a root canal, uh, getting rid of it, you know, excavating and, and, and aligning and putting a beautiful uh, filling or an onlay in there and getting them back function, I see it the same way, but with cosmetic dentistry. You know, um, beauty is weird. Um, you know, I'm. It's just, it's just. It's all in the eyes of the beholder. I notice when I'm in, in in Europe for the last thirty years, they always say, "Yeah, those Americans. Why do they whiten their teeth so much? Oh my God, that and that wasn't half of it until the Middle East got into uh, cosmetic dentistry. Because if you're wearing an all black veil and the only thing you're showing is this area." My God, there's not a white enough shade in Saudi. I mean, there's just not. I mean, Middle East, those girls, they want it. They want it whiter than white. Um, how do you um, How do you determine that if she's? Uh, b- because I, I got to tell you, my first uh, my first veneer case. It was after I did LVI with Dickerson back 100 years ago. Fred Flintstone was in the class, Barney Rubble. And uh, I came back, and he had convinced me to use this lab um, by a guy named Matt up in Idaho. And it was like $400 a veneer, whatever. Long story short, I do this case, and oh, my God, it was just perfect. She looked at it and started crying because it was so ugly, because there were mammalian grooves and there. It was just the most naturally perfect aesthetic thing. So what did I do? I cut off these $400 veneers, re-impressed, sent it to Glidewell for $89, and, and, and they gave me 10 piano keys. I glued them on, and now she's crying because they're the most perfect thing. And I don't even understand the word natural. I mean, how does it look natural that you have lipstick on? I mean, do you sit there and say, my God, your vermilion border has such excellent circulation. It's like I can see the red blood cells coming out. They're, they're plastic surgery. They're anti-gravity. Their facelifts look like they're, you know. I mean, I, I just look at this and say, you know, I don't even know what to do. All I do is I refer to the guy up the street from me that that once he's a glutton for this type of punishment. I do. I, I, I'd I rather take a pedo kid pediatric dentistry that, you know, needed four chrome steel crowns than do a veneer case on a woman. So how do you, um, and then when they say, I want it to look natural, I mean, natural like what? Um, the coronavirus, natural like HIV, natural like a black hole sucking in the galaxy. What, what? I don't even know their language, but how do you, how you have your signature, um, you have the signature smile makeover approach to oral beauty. Um, what is your signature smile makeover approach to oral beauty and how do you figure out who you're even dealing with when you're talking to that patient? Yeah. So <laughs> let's, let's take that. Uh, that that's a multifactorial question. <laughs> like everything you said that's there. That's a rant. That's just a rant. You should just. Yeah, it's just a good rant. rant. And you know what? <laughs> Today, just to you know, to go away from this a little bit, but still in the topic. Um, just finished up, my whole staff just left. We had, at the end of the day, I had to redo a veneer case of eight upper veneers. And the reason was, is that I missed something in that, in the diagnostic aspect of what the patient wanted. And it's very tough because people want natural, but what they really are saying are chiclets and you, you got to read between the lines. And what made it so, uh, uh, difficult is that UPS was supposed to have delivered it last night and it didn't come last night. And my staff stayed over time. We spoke to our driver at home because we have his number and he promised over here in the morning because he knew it was on the truck. And patient was scheduled 3, 3 p.m. today. 3 p.m. comes, no case. Uh, my office manager is running around the neighborhood trying to find the truck. 
patients in the chair. Question is, do we number her up and start this up? Not, these are things that, that dentists, you know, whether, whether it's cosmetic or anything, this is just, you know, the extra stress that we don't need. But the main thing is that I, I missed a cue, right? I missed something initially because I already did these veneers. I did them about a month ago. And I tried to convince her that it was perfect because I thought it was, but I missed something. But as far as what is natural versus, you know, what people actually want, it's completely changed. My father, his name is Gary Davidowitz. So Gary Davidowitz was at NYU at the time that they placed the first veneers. I think it was 1982. So it was the first time they were bonding that uh, the, the porcelain veneers and figuring out how, how it works. They didn't know at that time over reduction, less you know, less enamel, less adhesion. But they they, they were getting the, their bearings, and at that point there were a lot of limitations in cosmetics. But he moved on and he became uh, the uh, international aesthetics professor at NYU, and he was teaching dentists from actually all over the world. They would come and they have a separate program for these international dentists, and he would show them these kind of tips to success that I've taken over as far as. How do we uh, how do we learn from people's interviews and how can we create something that people actually want? And the main thing is obviously good verbal communication. You got you got to take your time. Uh, a lot of what's going on during Corona now is how can we do everything remotely and not see patients, right? But there's a there's a there's a big need to actually see the patient and actually get to know them. They have to like you, you have to like them, they have to feel comfortable, you have to get the right information, you have to be able to ask the right questions depending where these people are from. Uh, you may ask the questions in a different way, but you really have to try to get a sense of what they're looking for. Two is we always do smile simulations. There's all different ways of doing this these days. Uh, with digital dentistry, you can download a program and do it yourself, you can have your laboratories do it. We're always showing the patient what we are envisioning after our initial consultation and interview, how is that gonna look as the way that I'm seeing it? Whether it's the, the, the color, shade, the uh, texture, if it's gonna have line angles, uh, length, uh, the, the, the whole deal. And then I have a separate consultation after showing them that, that image. I, I don't just send them an email and say, here you go, I have them come back. And we review that simulated smile. So a lot of the visual and the understanding is there. They, they, they're, they're knowing what they're getting. That image then is waxed up. Always do a wax up when you're doing a full smile makeover. I even do wax ups. Uh, you know, I used to be embarrassed to say it, but not anymore. For two veneers. If I'm doing two lateral veneers, I still do a wax up. It, a lot of my colleagues say it's a waste of money. So when you redo a case like that, is that, um, is that warranty? I mean, do you eat the lab bill? Do you say, look, ma'am, I know it's not perfect, but I'm not going to let perfect be the enemy of damn good. Uh, would, are, you, are you they, they going to have to pick up the lab bill or anything or time, money, materials, anything? Right. So, I mean, uh, on our side, we would say, how could that be? Right. The, our time is worth pretty darn a lot. Uh, lab bills are high. Um, but at the same time, following the, the aesthetic tips of success of showing these simulations, having transitionals that are made out of wax ups, right? So it's exactly what you plan on making with digital dentistry, reading these wax ups and the actual transitional veneers in the mouth, they should be used to everything to the point where, which is most of my cases, about 99.9%, they're ecstatic at the end. Shading could always be something, but the actual definition of the teeth using computer assisted design and then and then actually milling out these units these days, it's basically what they had as a transitional veneer. So they're almost always happy. With that, uh, yes, that small percentage, I do it as a warranty. It's, it's all on me. Uh, some people you can't make happy. Some people are crazy. Um, and a lot of people are crazy. I'm crazy, but yeah, <laughs> yeah myself but included. Can, yeah. But some people you just, you know, you cannot make happy and that, that's where you got to like draw the line. And, you know, there are times where I'll be like, Hey, I, I dropped the ball because of X, Y, and Z. And I, I need to redo this. There are other times I will continuously just repeat myself that, Hey, this is actually the best that 
I believe I could do for you. And if I don't think I could do better, I'm not going to cut these things off and potentially cause an irreversible reaction to your pulp and have other issues going on here and have less adhesion of the veneer. So you, you got to, you have to use your judgment, but definitely if, if, if I just did a case, it's a large case and, and the patient's not happy. And I think that, Hey, okay, now that I understand what's going on here, I can make it better. I will, I will not charge them. And that's the importance of charging the right amount initially and not, not keeping your fees super low and competitive, right? Because you kind of need that, that the room for when those cases have to be redone and you're, you're going to take some of that profit from somewhere and, and give it over to somebody else. And so for you kids, I want you to real, think about something really quick. Let, let's just say for easy math, the average overhead was um, 80%. It's actually 65% according to the ADA. Now, when I got out of school in 87 and when your dad got out, Gary, what, what year did Gary get out of dental school? <clears throat> he was in 78. 78. Um, anyway, overhead used to be 50%. Now it's 65%, but for easy math, let's say it's 80%. And let's say you do an implant case and you place five implant cases, but one of them fails and you have an 80% overhead. Well, to warranty redo this 80% overhead costs the profits of the other four cases. And so the reason Walmart has a no questions asked return policy is because only 1% uh, of um, um, the stuff gets returned. Uh, I think the media makes everyone think that if you you know go to the park, you're going to get a, a, a van's going to drive by real slow and offer your grandkids candy and sell. It's just so rare. I mean, um, most people are good. I'll give you another example. When um, um, Gaspar Lazarus, an orthodontist out of uh, New Orleans, uh, and a good game last night, New Orleans. That was the the, the Saints. Uh, weren't the Ains last night. That was an amazing game. But when he did Orthodontic Centers of America, he did the most genius thing. He, um, he offered um, free financing. So so think this out. Uh, let's say I go get my nails done. And uh, and I do. I get my nails done uh, and pedicure because uh, I have uh, my brother's gay. And uh, so when we get together, I mean, uh, he doesn't want to eat and be fat like me. And I don't want to go see all the movies he wants to see. So often we go get our nails done. Let's say I went in there to get my nails done. And they said, okay, Howard, it's $100, and you need them done once a month, and I'm going to sell you a two-year contract, so 100 a month, 24 months, it'll be $2,400, and I'll need a third down, and I'll finance the other two-thirds at 10% interest. Well, I, you would think that's ridiculous. And that's what orthodontists do all day long because the brackets are 100 bucks. Uh, why do you need a third down? When, when the orthodontist says, uh, I need a third down, I would say, well, if braces are two years, a third down would be eight months. Are you going to prepay your staff for eight months? Are you going to prepay your rent, mortgage, equipment, build out, computer, insurance, malpractice, computer updates? Portfolio? Hell no, it's just ridiculous. So Gaspar Lazarus, which is the only guy who started a DSO that made it on the New York Stock Exchange with a billion dollar valuation before the orthodontist started getting weird about it. Um, you know, he financed all this stuff because there's nothing to finance. I mean, my gosh, there's no finance. You know, in dentistry, 80% of your cost are variable costs of lab labor and our people um, lab supplies. Only 20% is your fixed cost. Variable cost is um, uh, increases if you have more from one patient to 100, you have 100 times cost. Fixed cost is I got to pay my rent, mortgage, bill, that computer. I got to pay my rent whether I'm open or closed. So, um, but, but when you go back to these old guys like this, here's where this rant was leading. If you go back to guys as old as Gary and Gaspar Lazarus and Howard, they still believe that only stacked porcelain is aesthetic. And all this stuff you're milling out on the, the computer is, is, is not real. So what do you, how does a young guy like you um, do CAD cam milling when every dentist over, probably over 50, thinks Feldspathic stacked porcelain is the only beautiful stuff? How, how, how do you change their mind about that? I have to say, Feldspathic porcelain is beautiful, I, and I still use it on cases where I know it's a, a young dentition, they're not grinders, there's no signs of wear and tear. It's a beautiful material, it really is. The newer materials, lithium disilicate, lithium silicates, are gorgeous as well. Uh, they really are. It, it, when done properly, 
they look great, but their strength is there, meaning less problems, less chipping, less issues down the line. It also allows for the use of digital impressions and then overlaying your transitional veneers, which you now put into the patient's mouth to design it in the exact same proportion because a milling machine is not human. It's going to take exactly what you adjusted in the mouth, right? After we do our transitional veneers, we realize, oh, this is this cusp is way too long. This is going to be a, dom a dominant cusp. It shouldn't be. We got to reduce that. And you do all that work. And you take an image of that, a right, digital image, and now a laboratory that is well-versed in this digital uh, atmosphere is able to map that out and overlay it and literally mill that out. And then they could add their beauty to it, right? There's always additional things that could be done afterwards. You actually get a better result. It, it's, it's less human error. And I love humans. I'm human, I think. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if you allow the computer to do 99% and the human to do 1%, I think we get closer to 100% perfection. So, um, um, I know my homies. I mean, we, we, we've had this show for years. Um, whenever you say something like digital impressions, you, you didn't say what kind. So they're already thinking, was it 3M uh, TrueDev? Was it um, iTero from uh, Align Technology? Was it, um, um, you know, so so will you go through? And the other thing is, when you come out of school with $400,000 student loans, if you said, well, you need a CAD CAM, okay, there's 100 grand. You need a CBCT, there's 100 grand. You need a Millennium Late, there's 100 grand. So would you um, go over um, what technology is worth the return on investment for you? What what do you not need? Or, you know, what, what did you have to buy? And think of that 25-year-old baby that just got out of dental kindergarten school, and she's just, she doesn't want to go out and buy, she doesn't want to double her student loan debt on three purchases of equipment, especially if she doesn't need them, but she wants to grow up to be like you. She wants to be a New York City cosmetic dentist. What technology would she have to buy and would you recommend and is worth the return on investment? So I'll say, along with most dentists in this country, I have my closet filled with toys that I'll probably never, ever use. It's just, it's things that the, the rep made seem so cool. And it, it seemed like it was going to save me money, time, uh, effort. It's gone, right? So it, what I learned over the decade plus, uh, extending close to 15 years now, is you, you got to speak to people, right? You have to, you have to talk to people that have used this technology before you go ahead and and give your credit card or finance or, or things like that. Find out how it was in other people's hands. Doesn't mean it might be right for you, but don't always trust that, you know, the lead statements of an advertisement. And, uh, you know, the, the, um, the ability to get forward as a cosmetic dentist or it's really just to be known in your area as the person on top, you, you do have to invest. And yes, I still have my student debt. I'll probably have it until I'm 78, according to my last uh, uh, calculation. But that's okay. It's a part of the game. So is investing in things. It just adds to your investment. Why do people invest, right? Why do we go into real estate? Why do we invest in the stock market? It's to make money off of that investment. So an investment should always have a return of investment. But it doesn't always have to. An example of that is I brought in uh, into my practice something called the Solea laser, right? By Convergen, a super expensive piece of technology. Uh, I could probably do the same things at a fraction. I can't even think of the fraction because it's so small of the cost, right? A, a burr with a handpiece that I already have, I could do the same thing with my Convergent laser. But it, it helped transform my practice on so many levels, whether it's those who are crazy fearful of the drill, whether it's uh, uh, with their sleep uh, solea that I'm able to use now. And then there's the fact that my dentistry is better. 
I'm able to get these margins around my crowns like my diode laser can never do or any other laser can do. I'm able to mill my crowns in the office with so much more certainty that I'm not going to have trouble. I'm going to be able to make money on that one crown and I have to redo it. I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to have these long appointments. So that crazy investment on the Solea laser ends up not that it's a return of investment as far as, oh, I bought this piece of technology and now I'm able to do all these other procedures. It just means that my procedures are actually going to have less issues, less problems, less, uh, less sending back to the labs, less you know, time in the chair. Uh, my, my, my main focus is on always excelling, going further than what we're trained. When you're in dental school, we're not trained on anything. You know, whether you, whether you go to Columbia or NYU, we always have a little uh, fun with that in New York City. I, I still believe when you get out of dental school, we don't know anything. There's nothing. Uh, we know how to do the basics. And you should never feel uncomfortable about going past your comfort zone. Always learn. Take more CEs. Uh, talk to your colleagues. Your colleagues are not competitors. They're really not. Even in New York, I, in my four block radius, I have like 10 dentists because we have a high population. It's fine. These are your colleagues. Learn from them and purchase things, whether it's $100,000 or $3,000, make the investment if you feel that it's going to take you to the next level. Don't be afraid. Take, it, take you to the next level. If you're just going to be doing what your father did or what your dentist did as you were growing up, you'll probably be left behind. So um, would you say that you're more a digital dentist and milling this out chair side or digital dentist sending it to a lab and they're milling it out chair side? Or are you still, um, you know, taking uh, polyether and sending it to a lab and they're pouring up stone and models? And, and, and would you say that you're more the lab or you're more have a lab man in, in, in a lab that's not in your office? Uh, so I have uh, laboratories that are not in my office. I, I never wanted to have a laboratory in my office. I have uh, some friends of mine who do. They're, it's great when you do, especially in those moments where you have somebody in the chair and you have to change the shade and they could stain and things like that or dentures and they can pour it up right there. Uh, I, I have great relationships with laboratories all across the country, depending on the case, um, as far as what we use. Uh, the... Uh, Digital dentistry that we used from the get-go, from basically once I opened the practice, was digital scanning, right? Just to take an impression without having to take an analog impression. And I have a gag reflex. I hated impressions. So when the technology was there, not just you know, not just for Seric, but to actually just take an impression that was that was viable and we could actually use, I bought into it right away. It was a fortune, and I never used it. It stayed in my corner of my operatory, and I was still using polyether, I was using PBS because it was a, a, a pill. I had to spray uh, this uh, glitter all over the patient. They look like they just went to a strip joint. Um, and, <laughs> and then they would have to go home to their, uh, to their spouse and explain what, you know, where they were. And they're like, oh, it's about my dentist. Uh, and it was, it was tedious. But as time evolved, as time went on, these impressions got easier to take, more accurate to take, quicker to take. And it was worth the initial investment. Why? Because I was already in. I was already, I already invested into it. And that was a tremendous. I mean, just to be able to take these digital impressions instead of taking these analog impressions, sending them to a lab, carrying back to the lab, going back and forth and things like that. You could see it. When you're taking a, a digital impression, you see your margins. You see, if you can't see it, the lab can't see it. I remember uh, with my first impressions, I was like, I see like about 340 degrees in the margin. The lab is going to figure out the rest, right? They can, because they're a lab. They see like thousands of these. I'm sure they can figure it out. When I got into digital impressions, it changed me. It was like, how the hell can they figure out where this margin is? I'm seeing this in like high definition. I can magnify it with my fingers. I still can't see the margin. There's no way that this restoration is going to fit properly. This is only going to bite me in the ass. I shouldn't be sending this in. So digital impressions is really that first layer of the digital atmosphere. Just recently, uh, I got to the next. So 
originally I, uh, I was in an office that used a CEREC. I dabbled with it. Um, it, it was tedious. It's, it was hard because you know what? I, I didn't have the time. I, I didn't, and it was all me. It's still all me. And I just didn't have the time to be that lab tech and also be the dentist. Um, so I, I still worked with laboratories, but I was working with digital dentistry uh, just recently with the whole COVID uh, and everybody out in, in New York City wanting to get in and out, right? I come into your office. I don't want to see you for six months because I have no idea what the world's going to be like. I invested in Glidewell's uh, Fastmill, the Fastmill IO. Uh, and I trusted, I trusted the Glidewell because Glidewell has thousands of crowns coming in uh, every week. And they have such a, this, this artificial intelligence of, of picking out these crowns. I didn't have to become a lab tech. And it's worked out really well, but we're talking in the past year. So designing my own restorations, just the past year. Prior to that, always labs, always working if it's cosmetic cases with these simulations, wax ups, uh, digital scans of the transitional veneers or crowns, and then copying that over to the final. So using the digital atmosphere to create this predictable result, therefore having less unhappy patients right, to, to just a small percent, and also having more accurate impressions. Because as I said, if you can't see the margin, don't send it in, right? Have them come back. There's no reason for it. It's a waste of time. So having this opportunity to see things so grandiose and seeing like these, like the, the margin blown up to be like four times both of our faces put together is an amazing thing. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you on the spot. And, and um, so you said the fast mill. So uh, a townie posted today, um, I am thinking of getting this mill. was wondering if anyone has any experience with it. It, it looked great at Benko's showroom, and we even had an eight-hour CE on it. For single units with various materials, I can see a benefit. It mills post-centered zirconia, but also softer materials seemingly well. Any others out there? The next guy says... Um, I use this daily. The one at Benco is the TS-150E. The one from Glidewell is the Fastmill IO. They have the same internal components and mechanisms. The Fastmill IO is a smaller footprint. You will be able to mill Emacs soon, if not already. I love the mill for single units. Happy to talk if needed. Been using it for almost three years. And then the last guy says, what's the ballpark price on one of these bat boys? You think he meant to say ball boys or bat boys? Oh, bat boys, yeah. So, um, so, um, how would you answer uh, th all that guy's thread? Yeah, as of now, the Fastmill IO, since I introduced it, it was literally in March because that's when New York got crazy hit. Um, and I started looking into it. I brought it into the practice April. I was seeing emergencies so that if I had to do this crown, I could spit it out right away. Uh, it's great for posterior, right? First, second molar crowns. Uh, they have their Bruxer now. It, it, I mean, everything about it was perfect. It's easy. Uh, it, it integrates well. I use the Itero scanner uh, right now. Uh, it integrates beautifully with that. Their library of teeth that they're designing for you is almost there. Like you, you basically only have to modify these, these CAD CAM images uh, slightly, basically. The milling time is about 40 minutes. So for quadrant dentistry, what I do is I'll prep the crown. I will design. I will start the milling, get right back into the room, finish the quadrant, do my uh, MODs, DOs, whatever else is going on there. And by the time I'm done with that, the crown is done. Relieve the sprue, cement the crown. Um, so it's been tremendously profitable all in one visit all while the patient is still numb from the IAN block. So it's, it's, it's been great. As far as anteriors, I have, I have not yet, because it's only been months, I haven't used it for anterior cases yet, and I, I probably wouldn't. I have such a great relationship and love with my ceramists and, and, and laboratories that I'm using for my anterior cases. The is is there any, any names you want to give on that or... Um... Uh, so I love uh, Brooks. Uh, it's uh, Larry and John Brooks from Smile Vision. Uh, I think that they play a huge role in the same lecture that my father gave and I had to listen to growing up 
uh, of his aesthetic steps to, to success as far as having a good wax up and going along the way. Uh, Smile Vision, which are the Brooks, they are doing that visualization uh, of the of a smile simulation for you. And they're actually waxing up to the exact same proportions. They do such a fine job of following the same technique. I love those guys. Uh, and their, their work is phenomenal. Well, Lawrence is a dentist. So he's a dentist that owns a lab. That's right. Yes. And his, his son is a, a lab technician uh, that is licensed. Uh, and uh, there, but exactly, you have that too. I think it's great to have that dentist there as well because he went through it he went through the grind um and that's so important right lab technicians sometimes will hate on the dentist because they're like what what am i supposed to do with this right or what does he want from me but to have somebody there that went through the grind of cosmetic dentistry or dentistry alone uh is great so you you went with um so you said you started out with digital impressions which on uh, dent splicer on a member dent Spli, x-ray they bought uh, Serona, which used to be Siemens, and now it's all one. That's Serac. But now you say you're using um, the Itero, which Align Technology owns Invisalign and Itero. Um, did you use? Um, did you go with Itero because obviously you're a cosmetic dentist and you do a ton of Invisalign? Because if you scan with like uh, three shapes um, or uh, uh, TrueDef, I think 3M sold off TrueDef. I mean because Align Technology is only going to take a scan from their own scanner, correct? That's yeah. That was that happened. That did so, happen. So was that the was that the mafiosa hard tactic where a cosmetic dentist said, "Well, you got to buy Itero because Align is obviously the company." And I've asked a lot of orthodontists; they got upset with that because um, I own Ortho Town too, and the orthodontists on me they go, "Yeah, that really pissed me off." And I said, "Well, are you going to quit using them and use another clear liner?" And they go, "Well, unfortunately, I they have the best aligners." So did, was that a good strategy from uh, Joe Hogan where he said, well, I know we got the best product. So if I only take iTero scanners, you got to deal with me. So is that why you probably went with iTero? Because right, so I had the 3M. I had the 3M. That was the glitter with the strip club. Um, 3M Lava, I believe <laughs> it was called. Uh, and then uh, Cadent was taken over by iTero, right? Or, or rather by a line. They, they termed it iTero. I was familiar with Cadent. Uh, I, I, I knew somebody who knew somebody that was in the company of Cadent, uh, but they transformed it. Align is amazing. They really are. Invisalign is an amazing company. Uh, Joe is a great person to be leading the company now uh, for innovation. Uh, I was a huge Invisalign provider. So yeah, that played a huge role as far as where I'm going to throw my money and my trust. Uh, it, it went with what, what they were selling. Because I knew that it would integrate well with all my Invisalign patients. I had at one point, I had 67, 67% of my patient base undergoing or finish with Invisalign in my practice, which is crazy. Uh, they they already went through it or they were undergoing it. And to not go with a system for my restorative cases that is so compatible with a line didn't make sense. Well, you know, I, I love you for that because I remember when I got out of dental school in 87, um, the cosmetic dentist would come through town. And it, to me, I was just mortified. The whole room was clapping and I was like nauseous because it was always the same. It would be like some girl that's already beautiful. It's, it's always a girl who's already beautiful and doesn't need crap. And then she has some crowding and this and this. And then the next slide eight upper, eight lower teeth are filed down to rice kernels. You're like, oh my God. And they go, and um, I love the fact that now, you know, they used to have to do a bunch of endo. So, you know, you do a cosmetic case and you have to do, well, well, we have to root canal these four teeth. And I love the fact that I think a real cosmetic doctor um, will unravel a lot of that stuff so you don't have to peel off uh, all the banana peeling and nerves and root canal. So I love the fact that you, you said you finish all these uh, cosmetic cases with Invisalign. I love the fact that we can unroll these, these 
this crowding so we don't have to stick every tooth in a pencil sharp, especially lower in size. My God, when you prep a lower incisor for a crown, it's a rice kernel. And I only eat rice when I want to sit down and eat like 2,000 of the same thing. Just I just want to eat 2,000 same things. And um, yeah, so that the, 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 those were gross. Those were... Uh, my those, favorite, my favorite thing, Howard, is when somebody loses their temporary veneer, all right? It happens. It happens all the time. Uh, if somebody loses their temporary veneer, what are we thinking about? We're obviously thinking about occlusion. We're looking at uh, excursions and why did this come off? But that's on the side point. My favorite part is somebody says, I, I don't really have to come in because it doesn't look so bad. It doesn't, you know, it, it's fine. I can wait the extra four days. If I didn't straighten those teeth prior, expand the arch and they had this little peg that was sticking out there there's not a chance in hell that they would say it's okay because they would be in excruciating pain and they would be looking terrible so it's all about conservative dentistry and the, the way to do that is multifactorial you have to think about everything um, and the easiest way is using for adults is using clear aligners to get these teeth into a better position the beautiful thing about putting veneers on teeth is that teeth don't have to be perfect before you put veneers on them. Because if they were, you wouldn't be putting the veneers on them. So the alignment doesn't have to be perfect. You just want it to be better, right? You want that, you, you want the, uh, the clearance to be there. You don't want overlapping. Uh, you want to be able to minimally prepare these teeth. So using, you know, a line, Invisalign, or whatever clear aligner system, I even came up with my own aligner system that me and my partners are involved in to get teeth into a healthier location, better looking, and then do your restorative work, whether it's an implant, veneers, crowns, your work is going to last so much longer when somebody can floss normally between teeth. When somebody has a bite that's not going to be in a crossbite or into a heavy occlusion. Uh, so I think it should always play a role, at least on that ideal treatment plan. Like, Hey, let's, uh, let's straighten the teeth before we restore these teeth. Uh, um, so you were, I've also read some, um, but, um, you're excited about evoke. What is evoke? So evoke is pretty cool. Uh, evoke allows me, I'm a cosmetic dentist. So what do I know about facelifts? Uh, I know that Joan Rivers looked terrible before she was deceased. I know that you can overdo facelifts, um, but Evoke is a technology that uses radio frequency to help tighten and tone and reduce the fat of areas that we work with around the smile. So it's the lower third of the face, which is in the zone of a dentist, right? So when we're smiling and we're showing our teeth or if we're not smiling, what is framing our mouth? We got the orbicularis oris, we got our masseter muscles, right? And some mental, right, would be the floor of the mouth. So all those areas, when we're dealing with cosmetic dentistry, it plays a, a huge role. So if somebody has sagging skin and you give them a smile of a 20-year-old, you're using the LVI of a 20-year-old, right? And all of a sudden they have this youthful smile. So I'm going to pick the youthful smile, but their skin is like this when they're smiling, it's not gonna really complement each other. So what Evoke has allowed me to do is with a hands-free technique, it's, a, it's FDA a class two medical device. Uh, we're able to apply a stimulator that helps tighten the skin right around the areas of the smile, which is right on the jowls and right under the chin. And, and you, um, how much does it cost to get into somebody? Or what, what's the website for that? So it's in mode, I N M O D E. Name of the product is Evoke. They sell products for all over the body. There are many products there that might make you blush, Howard. And there are things that if I try to push on a patient, I would probably get arrested. But Evoke is the, is the, is the one that really fits in beautifully with anyone that's doing any cosmetic dentistry. It's a non invasive class two medical device, meaning not only do you not have to be licensed. Uh, to use it, you could actually have an assistant do it on your own. And it makes cosmetic dentistry so much better in those after pictures. Really? That is, uh, that is interesting. And, um, you're, uh, um, and it's, it's a big company. I mean, uh, my in mode is a leading global provider of innovative radio frequency, minimally and non-invasive aesthetic technology. 
uh, my gosh, uh, that is a uh, um, if you if you did a hundred of your signature uh, smile makeovers, um, how many of them would use that? So I would say probably about twenty percent, believe it or not. Uh, and it happens to be I'm a, I'm a strange cosmetic dentist. Uh, most of my colleagues that I talk to that are cosmetic dentists, their age bracket of where they're doing most of their work are on 40, 50, and 60 year olds, which is so, a, a so three 20, So 20 percent or one in five of your patients uh, use this in, in their case, yep. uh, evoke. And then back to um, sending it out to a lab versus uh, Glidewell's mill, what percent, if you did 100 cases, what percent would go out to a lab and what percent would you chair side mill? 100% of my cosmetic cases is going to go out to a lab. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Uh, second molars, first molars, maybe a bicuspid uh, of a single units, which for many dentists is their bread and butter, right? If I could do five single unit crowns a day, I'm golden. Uh, I think the mill is great for that. So, yeah. so you're using the chair side milling uh, for posteriors, same day dentistry. Exactly. Yes. That's that's, that's why just... I love the the glide well because that's what it's great at. Yeah. That, yeah. That's where that's where it's at. If I was going to try to do anterior aesthetic cases, I probably would not. You know. I, Glidewell is great. I would not. I would not be trusting their library for my anterior cases. So, if um, just for a specific tooth to keep it constant, first molar upper right, tooth number three. Unless you're Canadian, I don't even. I give up. Um, tooth number three. If you did a hundred sing a hundred patients for a hundred single unit crowns, what percent would you same day dentistry uh, chair side mill with the glide mill fast mill for uh, first molar number three? Yeah. So in all transparency, Howard, again, I just started this in, in, uh, March, April, literally, uh, before that everything was going into the lab since starting back up full time after we were closed down in New York, um, first molar, second molar, I would say 95% are going through my mill. That's nice. Yeah, it really that is. is nice. By the way, I uh, went out to Jim's, uh, 50th uh, birthday, uh, it's a 50 year anniversary of Glidewell. Right. And I, I did it. Yeah. I didn't get invited, but I got an email. Yeah. Oh my God. And, uh, that, that guy is just, uh, he's just a lot to me. He reminded me of Herb Kelleher who we lost in the beginning of this year. And, you know, um, with everything going on, they never make, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, hell, um, but anyway, he passed away, but, uh, I, I always thought he was a Herb Kelleher dentist. I mean, he came back from Vietnam and, um, you know, he, um, started that in his, um, apartment and, you know, he went to Vietnam with his best friend and his best friend didn't come back and it was just his rock bottom and he just poured his whole existence into, uh, dentistry and what, what a legend, what a man, what a, uh, just, I, I just, I just love that guy so much. Uh, I really, really do. Um, so the other guy out there in California who had another lab, um, it was Bob Ibsen. Bob Ibsen was an op, op, uh, opta, not an ophthalmologist, but an optician, uh, an eye doctor. And he was out there in Southern Cal and he noticed the cosmetic revolution coming. And, and, um, and so he started Denmat, which was dental materials. And it, he actually wrote the first book in adhesive dentistry, just wasn't called cosmetic dentistry. And, um, he started a lab on this stuff. He, he was the first advertiser for the um, Miss Universe contest, uh, Bob Ibsen, it was sponsored by Rembrandt. And he asked me, I remember him calling me and asked me what he, what I thought of that. And I said, I think it's a horrible idea because with the Miss Universe contest, I mean, obviously it's rigged because all the winners are from planet earth and I, there's not one other winner from anyone, even in our local cluster. Uh, but, uh, so, you know, it's a rigged election, but, uh, this beauty thing is just getting bigger and bigger. But I want to ask you this. Um, it's kind of inappropriate, but I'll, I'll just say it. Um, when they start doing breast augmentation, uh, they took off in Texas and they, they just couldn't be big enough. And then they got too big and they started coming back down. Right. And now, um, um, my friend, uh, Lawrence, uh, Shaw, 
Um, I mean, I mean, they they were you know they came out you know they started with a hundred cc, they went to two hundred cc, they went all the way up to four hundred cc. There were people one, and now they're coming way way back down, and and now um, they're you don't see the, like they used to be. Is that kind of happening in cosmetic dentistry? Did 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 veneers start out in the seventies and eighties just going Clorox bleach white crazy, and are they coming back? And and um. Are you are you seeing a trend line like that? That when it came off, it went too extreme, and now it's kind of coming back down to more normal. It's funny. I, I feel like cosmetic dentistry is behind. Um, I, I I feel like in plastic surgery and cosmetic dermatology, uh, I was actually trained by the uh, AAFE, American Academy of Facial Aesthetics, uh, uh, Dr. Mosselmacher, uh, and he. He has a he has this C courses. They do a great job training you for fillers, Botox, and his whole thing is natural. Less is more. Uh, it's everything that I was taught in cosmetic dentistry, both by my dad uh, and even in school. Right? You want you want to have the mammalons you mentioned before. You want to have translucency, um, and that's what we're told. People at this point. What I'm seeing, at least here on the East Coast, they don't want to see that anymore. They want to see this monochromatic, white blinding tooth with a Hollywood straight across and size of ledge. So no longer are we looking at the inverse of a smile line and things like that in order to get people their wands. Interestingly, with injectables, Botox fillers, with breast augmentation, with any other plastic surgery, there was a crazy period of time in the 90s where everything was hyperblown. Lips were like, you know, if I was sitting over here next to the computer, I might hit you in the face, Howard, with my lip because I got some lip filler, right? Same thing with the with, with the breast augmentation. And then it quieted down into more natural. I feel like dentistry or cosmetic dentistry kind of did the reverse. It started off with let's try to make things natural. What's beautiful? Natural. Let's have the mammalons. Let's have a translucent layer. And what I'm seeing for my patients is they don't want that anymore. Uh, more, more often than not. And that's the importance of that initial consultation, showing them different examples, doing a smile simulation. They're like, oh, I, I don't want that at all. I, I want it like straight across. I want it to look like a chiclet. And I'm like, really? Because, you know, and this is your body, it's your teeth, if that's what you want. But uh, it seems like teeth are kind of lagging behind, or if not even reverse of what happened in cosmetic dermatology and plastic surgery. Yeah, um, it's funny when I think of New York City, I I always think of Lady Gaga. That's probably that's probably the first thing that comes to my mind. If someone's at New York City, I think of Lady Gaga. And what what I like the most about Lady Gaga and Madonna uh, is uh, the word Vogue, and even the magazine, and I, you know, they have different looks. I mean. You know, there's a, there's a, some people that have the same look for 50, 60 years. And I just am so impressed how Lady Gaga or McDonough, you never know who's going to show up, what they look like. I, uh, my mom sent me a video on Lady Gaga just today, and she was, uh, what was she doing? Something with, uh, what was that, uh, The Sound of Music, These Are the Hills of The Sound of Music. And anyway, they were, it was a Julie Andrews deal and sure enough, she shows up. She looks just like, you know, the lady of the big old white dress. I, I just think it's so cool how people are just uh, so artsy like that. Like, we're making where did... my kids watch every classic movie I grew up in because we're all stuck. We were stuck at home for like two months. Uh, my wife is a nurse practitioner in a local hospital by us. So she was going into work and I got to really know my kids. But I made them watch every movie I had to watch growing up. And Sound of Music was one of them. And they were walking around the house whistling that song. Uh, I find that so funny. But sorry. Well, I, actually, Sound of Music is yeah. uh, Sound of Music. And uh, what's the one? Um, uh, what's the other one where it's a uh, um, Fiddler on the Roof? Right. Those that, those are my two favorite movies of all time. Now, I gotta I gotta divulge. I, I grew up with five sisters, but I think they were too young because they had nightmares. So I think that was the wrong move. 
but they, they loved sound of the music. They loved uh, Back to the Future. That's that's what I grew up on. Uh, these are yeah. And I, I think my, my 1930, yeah. 1980. You know, on Fill of the Roof, just blame the soundtrack because you don't even need to see the movie. But uh, my gosh, uh, it, but I grew up with five sisters, so that's why I've always been against democracy because I'd be like a uh, Monday Night Football, one vote, five <laughs> girls, Sound of Music, okay. And now when someone says, well, they're not very democratic, I'm always thinking, either am I. I've been burned by democracy on every Monday night football game my entire childhood. Um, so is there, um, what about even more specifics, like um, uh, cosmetic dentistry um, um, and terror teeth, obviously we're talking about. Um, do you have a favorite direct composite? Do you think one looks sexier, cosmetic, or, you know, than, than the uh, others do you, do you, are, in, are you uh, brand loyal and i mean your, and, and again it, this doesn't mean that this is the right it's all in the power of your hands and what you do with it uh, i think we have amazing dental companies and they're so innovative these days and what's coming out uh, it's worth trying them all and seeing what in your hands comes out the best and then following it through um i, lo I love following through with my patients so when they come in for their recalls I am noting, not in their charts, but I have a, a little notebook in my office uh, about what material I used at that point, how the restoration looks radiographically, um, and how it looks visually. It, it's just so helpful because things sometimes look beautiful at the moment and they're easy to place, but they just don't hold up. Uh, so it's my own anecdotal uh, clinical evidence in my office. And I've changed many times because of that, because retroactively, it's not as great as it seemed initially. Uh, right now, I'm loving uh, Voco Admire Fusion for my anterior composites. It's a uh, ceramic hybrid composite. Voco what? V O C O Higher Fusion. A D M. A D M. I R A. I R A. Fusion. Fusion. One word or two. Uh, two. Two. And why do you, why do you like? Voco, uh, admire, admire. Yeah, I th the consistency is amazing. I just feel like a build up anything, uh, both anterior and I, and I also use it posteriorly. Uh, the polish ability is amazing. Uh, it just looks so natural. And yes, it, it, com it, it comes in all the shades that you would expect, but somehow it has this chameleon feel to it where if I'm off a shade and I put it on there and I cure it and I polish it, it just blends in beautifully. You know, um, morals and values are bizarre. Like um, dentist, um, someone will be missing a six-year molar. And they'll say, well, my God, I'm not going to file down two virgin teeth. You're, you're an animal. You do that. I'm going to place an implant. Okay, so then I'm at uh, Lifetime Fitness, and my air, nose, and throat guy comes up to me and says, good God, I keep seeing these implants into sinuses and I'm up there in a scope and it's all a fungus infection. What the hell are you guys doing in my sinus when you had two perfectly good teeth? And I'm like, perfectly good? Uh, are you saying they were a virgin? I don't even know what a virgin tooth is. How do you get out of dental school and say a tooth is virgin? I mean, uh, it doesn't even make sense, but the ENT say stay out of my sinus and they have schooled me. Uh, one of them is a uh, rhino, rhinopathist or rhino guy or whatever. And I mean, just some horror cases where some lady thought for 20 years that she moved to Arizona and developed all these allergies and her, you know, but, and she finally goes to uh, uh, guy who sticks a deal and he goes, no, it's a failing root canal or a failing implant. Nine out of 10 times, it's a failing root canal. I mean, most dentists have never found an MB2 in their entire life and every tooth has one. And so this lady's got an MB2 draining into her sinus and, and all that stuff. Um, so where do you, um, and, and then on the anterior, it's the same thing. I know I'm not a cosmetic dentistry. I'm not you. But if I had to do, replace a missing tooth, on a beautiful woman, I can nail it with a three unit bridge. I mean, I can nail it, but if I go in there and place an implant and the implant doesn't heal just right and, and whatever, next thing you know, I got black triangles and spaces. So isn't it, I mean, if you saw someone missing um, a, a, an anterior tooth, would you just say, I'm a cosmetic dentist, damn it, in the biggest city in America, you're going to get an implant and I'm going to nail it? Or would you ever be that, 
that guy who files down virgin teeth and do a three-unit bridge with maybe a veneer, um, you know, because cosmetics are more important. I know that's a long question, but I'm so dumb. What I do is I, I just throw out a rant, and I hope something sticks, and you get a question out of that and can answer it and sound uh, informative. <laughs> Yeah, if my answer makes no sense to you, it means I totally didn't get it. But um, <laughs> what what I what I love is to treat every case differently. So I, I'm not a slam dunk uh, implant guy. Uh, I mean, anteriorly, you got to be crazy to be. If you don't have if you don't have a immediate replacement implant, and the the gingiva gets blunted straight across, and you have no papilla there. You're, you're, you're screwed. I mean, there's no way you can make that look good. You, you can make it like a square, right? Of course, and then you try to like close everything up. That's not going to be a tank. Uh, you're not going to be able to clean properly and it's not going to look good. Or you could do a beautiful three unit bridge. So every case is dependent on what's going on. What was the etiology and the disease process? What, what am I left with? And what do I see as being the most cosmetic result? Not just cosmetic, but long-term cosmetic. I mean, three in a bridge, we could do a, a slam dunk and make it look awesome. But what if 10 years later, all of a sudden that pontic is now like four millimeters past the ridge, right? For attrition. So it, it goes both ways. But I definitely don't lean towards that whole thought process of this implant is always the most ideal option. It really depends on what's there. What are we working with? How is it going to look? And how easy is this going to be to clean and maintain? Well, that was my, my follow-up question is if you're, because everybody around the world knows, I mean, New York City is the biggest beast in America. I mean, it's, uh, w what's the metro of that sound? Have you, uh, do you, you know? What what's the, the what? Uh, metro population is of New York oh. City? Uh, 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 a lot. I yeah, know, I mean. This. I, I know that the building right on top of me, it's one of the tallest buildings here on the Upper East Side, that if I had, uh, uh, half of the of those apartments as patients, right? I, I would be set. So that means in my building alone, I could have my practice run for 30, 40, 50 years just off of this apartment. But on my block, I have about six of those, right? So it, it's tremendous. It's a tremendous population per square foot. Oh, I mean, uh, Google... Uh, says that the New York City metropolitan population is 18.8 .8 million. My favorite, my favorite uh, study I, or uh, graph I have was uh, um, at ASU. Um, if every of the 8 billion humans, if they all lived at the same density of Manhattan, we could all live in New Zealand <laughs> and never even have to touch another continent. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Uh, the density is about, but being the cosmetic guru in the biggest city in America, do you need all porcelain implants? I mean, are you telling implant companies, I can't do titanium on front, it's Lady Gaga, I need a all porcelain implant, something like that, or do you not? So I do, I do uh, zirconia implants every enter case. Um, you do? Yeah, I take the risk uh, that's involved with it. So that in six, seven years, I'm not seeing any titanium from any recession that's there. So it's a zirconia interior. As we get uh, past the smile line, we go titanium. Oh, my God. I've been looking for someone crazy enough to make me an online CE course for Dental Town. We put up 400 one-hour courses. They've been viewed over a million times, and uh, I can't get find anybody. But anyway, I, I would just be honored if you made any course on there. But that is a... That is a um, that was the first thing I was thinking when I was uh, again a podcast you saying, I wonder if he ever did that because a lot of just people say um, you can't if it breaks or something goes wrong, it's just a nightmare. You can't remove it. You got to drill out the whole thing. What 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 brand are you using? So for my zirconia abutments, you're saying no or zirconia my implants. implants. Yeah, for the implants. So I I actually don't place them, Howard. That's what makes it easy for me. So I have my oral surgeons and I give them my preference and I say go zirconia because I want it to be as and, and what brand what brand is he using? It it depends. So I have four different oral surgeons here, so it's across the board. It's across the board. Ah, because that is uh do you, you want think... to talk too much about it because it's not it's I don't do I'm trained in placing implants, but I'm doing the restorative aspect. I wouldn't want to give pros or cons on the implants itself because I, 
I'm not familiar with the actual placement for them. But but do you think do you see the trend uh, of all porcelain zirconium implants? Do you think the trend will go up or do you think it'll go down? So I think that eventually it's going to go up. Uh, once the success rates are shown that those horrible cases that we're seeing of a fractured implant and the, right at the junction of the platform, uh, and what do you do at that point uh, is decreased, people are going to feel a lot more confident. Everybody wants to have the more cosmetic option, right? PFMs, when I was being trained, was the option, right? We had other materials, but that was that was what was known. But nobody wanted it. It was just because that was you know what was working. You have to prove that the newer materials are going to have the longevity, and then everyone will quickly gravitate towards the more cosmetic option. A um, few more questions, do you mind? Sure. Um, I, I, I like these hundred questions. D Dennis, I mean, they're just like economists or physicists or mathematicians. If you did a hundred cosmetic veneer cases, a hundred individual people, um, what percent of them would get fillers and Botox? So the amazing thing is, is that on our forms, many of those that are getting their cosmetic work already has their dermatologist, plastic surgeon doing their fillers and Botox for them. So it's not like they're doing everything at once where they're like, oh, I want to redo my teeth. And then I also want to do my lips and I also want to do you know, my wrinkles and I want to do invoke and things like that. They're already doing work to themselves. Botox fillers are non-invasive. Veneers are more invasive, right? It's a much higher level. They couple together beautifully though. So if you're trained to do both, we're all trained to do veneers, right? You have to just feel comfortable doing them, but we're all trained to do big cases. And you couple that with knowledge of Botox, which by the way, is the easiest injection known to a dentist. I mean, what we're doing in the mouth uh, and where we're injecting is crazy because we don't see what the hell we're doing. We're just going off anatomical landmarks and the, and the average. When you're doing Botox, you're seeing, you're palpating. You're, it's, 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 it's a tiny insulin needle. It's crazy easy. But anyways, when you couple them together, you get so, so much more amazing results at the same place. They trust us already. They're coming in every six months for their preventative. They're part of our patient base. They trust us enough if they're doing their veneers to spend $30,000 to do their smile. They're going to leave that dermatologist or plastic surgeon like that. If you say with confidence that you're also going to continue the framing of the mouth to resemble the smile that they just did. So it's not so much to couple the treatment of the veneers together with the other modalities, right, of Botox fillers and Evoke, but rather convert these patients that are already doing something to themselves. So many people in major metropolitan areas are already doing and have somebody and having that as a part of your recall and it increases your revenue. It's easy. Uh, it, it, it just makes sense to add that on to your services. And a couple more hundred questions. Um, hundred cases of a smile makeover. What percent yeah. would be boys versus girls? Would it be eighty percent women? So it's it's uh, right now we're looking at about I would say 70, 30. Uh, seventy percent women, thirty percent men. My males are typically in the older demographic uh, compared to the females. So females we're looking at twenties, um, thirties, and forties for most of my cases. And the males I'm looking at about 50s and 60s. And what percent of the males are gay? Uh, I would say probably about 30%. And I'll tell you why. A lot of the cases that I'm doing on, on the males, uh, just over the years, what, what I've noticed, a lot of it is, is bruxism, attrition. It's they've ground down their teeth. It's restorative in nature. So uh, those are married men, the stressed out married men who... Brugs exactly. Right now. <laughs> Whereas those that are those that are yeah. gay are more, you know, their teeth are fine. They look great. They just want it to be even better. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, um, amazing. So um, final last and final question. Um, so she's in dental kindergarten school. She's listening to you. She when she grows up, she wants to be just like you. What, where does she learn to be a cosmetic dentist? She just got out of school. She just got out this year. What, give her baby steps. I mean, you know, it's 10 steps till you get to the second floor. Um, where, how should she start her journey 
to end up like you someday? Pretend that you know what you're doing when you get out of dental school. That's all you can do. And look in the mirror. There used to be this SNL character. I forgot his name. Uh, he would. You're good mirror. enough. You're yeah. strong. That guy. That yeah, guy. I forgot his oh. character name. I know it, it was. Um, anyways. So uh, <laughs> you got to feel it. You got to feel confident. As I said earlier in our talks tonight, and I still believe it. I mean, dental schools are great, but they're terrible. How much can you learn in a few years? I think dental school should be 10 years because there's, there's so much to learn and so much to, to, to appreciate and to, to do comprehensive cases. You're not going to get that in the three, four or five years that you're, that you're in, in school and residency. So when you get out, feel confident that, hey, you got through it. If you got through that, at least in NYU, was, you know, they put you through hell. If you got through that, you're able to get through anything as long as you have confidence. So have the confidence to move forward, but be critical. Be very critical of yourself. I think one of the worst things somebody can do is be passive, is to pass work that you know is not adequate, that you wouldn't want in your own mouth or in your mom's mouth, right? Uh, I think that's that's where that's the the point where somebody is going to be not just successful, but have a really rewarding career and feel good about the profession is when you're doing good work. I don't think that I did good work when I first came out of dental school. I know I didn't, but I learned from that. When I when I didn't know what the heck I was doing, I quickly looked up courses that I could take, or I spoke to people, or I spoke to reps, and I tried and tried again. But when in front forward facing of a patient, I always had confidence. I was like, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> Let's do it. But I knew that it could be better. And I, you got to train yourself, you got to invest in the right things, you got to keep moving forward, and then you'll do bigger and bigger cases faster and faster. A lot of my friends and colleagues are shocked at how many cases that I do, and I've only been practicing for 11 years. But it, I think it all came from, what would I want in my mouth? What would I want in my mom's mouth? How could I get there? What kind of C course could I take? I don't care if it costs $8,000. I'm already hundred thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt from dental school. I might as well do this the right way. If you're going to be in debt, do it the right way. So should we name this uh, podcast, uh, Dr. Stuart Smalley says, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. People like me. Yes. Yeah. That's well, it. I like you, and I like what you're doing, and I'm, uh, you know, my, my favorite people in dentistry are the pediatric dentists, because I don't, I don't know what the hell they're, I mean, what, what was their second best idea, just to go to hell and work on Lucifer? <laughs> I mean, to think that they consciously want to be around crying, screaming kids all day. Uh, but the, the, I tell you, I would rather, God bless them. I, God I'd bless rather them. do a sinus lift. I, in fact, I'll tell you how brave I am. Do you know my first sinus lift for an implant was on my, my mother-in-law? Wow. Now I'll probably get sued. by My HIPAA. first implant uh, out of the training, right? Not out of NYU was on my grandma. She was 92 <laughs> years old. She lost an incisor. She started going through some dementia. Uh, it, it, my mother's like, just do it for her. And I was like, it was an immediate implant, MIS, a little 3.3 uh, that I stuck in there, 3.0. And uh, yeah, and, and you know what? I That's how I would want to treat every single person <laughs> that walks into my door. Can we always know? But you always want it, you have to have that feeling because if you do, you're going to get better and better and your confidence goes way up. But if you're just like, how could I get through this procedure as quickly as possible and using the cheapest materials and, you know, hopefully they don't complain, you're not, you're not going to get there and it won't be rewarding. Howard, I want to talk about one thing before we hang sure. up, um, if, you, if you have the time. Yeah, uh, but. All right. So I spoke about Invisalign. I love Invisalign. I, I was an elite provider of Invisalign, still do t loads of it. New York loves Invisalign as well. Uh, everybody knows the name. It's a great brand. I use uh, clear aligners for a lot of my cosmetic cases. So uh, recently, about three and a half years ago, I started toying around with different plastics and different uh, algorithms of, of different companies that were out there. And you know them all, I'm sure. Uh, but I created a company called ModMouth, which is M-O-D-M-O-U-T-H. Uh, and what that is, is satellite offices of mine and my partner, Dentist. 
And it's clear aligners that are made affordable to kind of compete with what happened with Smile Direct Club and those other guys out there to keep it within the dental world and give people a more cosmetic result. In my own office and my partner's offices, we use it as a, an alternative to the higher uh, priced clear aligners out there for those cases. Because if, if I'm doing a 10 veneers and I'm like, oh, and by the way, I, I got to charge you another $6,000 to straighten your teeth first, I might lose that case. But if I could say, you know, for $2,000, I'll straighten your teeth first because it'll be a lot more conservative. That's a lot more palatable. So worked and worked and worked on it along with my partners. And we really found a, a group of people and a team to make clear aligners for the general dentist, right? We're not dealing with, uh, with AP corrections or, or crazy rotations of those molars past six degrees or big extrusion or intrusions of, of teeth. But for the majority of cases, that's not the case. They already had orthodontics, they relapse or whatever it may be. And we created this uh, MOD, M-O-U-T-H, and the, the purpose of it was for ourselves, really to use it ourselves for our own practices. But what we realized as we kind of shared it with our colleagues is that people loved it. They were like, oh, this plastic is great. It's so much more affordable. It's made by dentists. The dentists are behind it. We decided along with other partners to extend it out there to the general dentist and we're calling it Monmouth Pro. So it's M-O-D hyphen M-O-U-T-H dot com slash providers. And you're not going to get too much information there because we're keeping it kind of close to the chest right now because we're expecting to release uh, all the information in 2021. Uh, but it's just an alternative. It's, it's something else out there. Love Invisalign. I, I like Clear Correct. I like everything that was out there. I've, I've used everything. Uh, I, I used Essex aligners. And I, I, my, my first job was working in my dad's basement, taking Hillard pliers and heating it up and, 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 and uh, making these little indentations of plastic. So I love everything out there. But this is just a, it's an alternative for the general dentist to save on costs, have an aligner company that's made by dentists for dentists. We have so many cool ideas about ways of integrating this into practices, helping get patients there for restorative work uh, along with clear aligners. It's, it's something else out there. And I think it's really cool. So, it, you know, just sign up. You're not signing up for anything except for information by putting your information in there. So the MOD doesn't stand for mesial occlusal distal, it stands for modernizing the clear aligner space. That's exactly right. So it's a, it's a, it's a tongue in cheek uh, in a way, right? So we all, we all look at MOD as dentists and that's the first thing we think is a, is a nice large filling that maybe we should put an onlay into. Um, but uh, MOD is for the modern way of looking at the mouth is that, hey, I, I wanna get this alignment better before I put that crown on. I wanna get this alignment better before we put that implant in. I wanna, I wanna get this bite better so that I'm able to put these veneer cases in. It might not be this comprehensive orthodontic case where we're loading up the mouth with attachments or we're trying to do crazy rotations, extrusions, intrusions, or to translate these roots through bone in crazy ways. I just want it in a better position so it's better cleansability, it looks better, it's more cosmetic, and it's quick. Um, and that's the algorithms that we're using with Monmouth. So it's kind of that focus in mind to get through it as quickly as possible, less expensive, and, and help with the, the restoration. Well, that is, that is a amazing. And, and how is, how do you think um, this is going to be received in the marketplace? So we're not looking to go huge. Uh, we're actually looking to sign up, uh, you know, the first crew of dentists that ask for information, whoever wants to try out cases, we're going to give a nice discount so they could try it out. And we actually want to learn from their experiences to build this out super slowly not to compete with any of the large uh, you know, dogs out there uh, who are great. As I said, I use them in my prior practice, but it's to build something that's not just an aligner company, but it's actually something that is more of this restorative uh, uh, understanding from a general dentist and, and see what kind of help a company like Monmouth could do, aside from obviously a much less expensive aligner, which everybody likes, but what else could it help with? Perhaps it's people out there who need restorative work come to a site like ours because we're advertising that, you know, cause they need an implant space and they don't have it and finding that restorative dentist in Idaho, 
that is a mod mouth provider to use our system, get that space, have that dentist place the implant, have a great restoration. That's that's like one of the ideas that we have, but it's really going to be this collaborative for dentists, by dentists, a, a fun aligner company. You might not use it for everything. You might go back to a line for those comprehensive cases or other companies out there. But for, I think, the majority of relapse cases, restorative cases, um, and for, for uh for those that just, you know, six, $7,000 is too much. And maybe you, you want to give them another option. I think that's a great, a great company out there that I helped uh, co-found. Well, here, here's all I, so, um, and by the way, quit sending me emails guys about signing an NDA. I'm not going to sign an NDA. It's, it's a non-disclosure agreement. I mean, I've been in dentistry for 32 years. How hell, hell I podcasted 1500 people. You really think you're going to tell me something in dentistry? I've never heard. And furthermore, I think, uh, um, but here's what I, I want you, you don't need an NDA, you do this. Hold up your hand, it's gotta be faster, easier, better, cheaper, and smaller. And by the way, a lot of dentists have sent me deals that they, they, they don't like the word cheaper. Well, you know, if you decide to trigger yourself on the word cheaper, I have nothing to do with it, okay? You're, you're triggering yourself on your own, you don't need me. But it's gotta be better, faster, easier, cheaper, smaller. That's the nutshell. And dentists always send me something that, well, it's slower, more complicated, and costs twice as much. I know that's that's why the 87 car companies before Henry Ford, you don't know the names of them because it's five guys making one really expensive car for a king or a queen or a noble landlord. And if you just got to America four minutes ago, this is about the middle class. We don't give a shit about kings and queens and all that. So is it better, faster, easier, higher quality, smaller, you're going to make money. But here's the other thing. You probably already know that from listening to my show. But here's the other thing why I like his idea. And that is dentistry is a really old technology. I mean, just in America, GV Black was a century ago. Um, um, in France, Pierre uh, Fichard, that was two centuries ago. But dentistry is so old that, you know, it just grows with inflation. If, if the economy goes 3%, dentistry is 3%. But if you micro break that down, what's growing faster than the inflationary uh, growth? It's only two things, clear aligners and implants. So if you're a baby and you're still in dental school, you got to decide. I mean, Stephen's uh, been completely honest. That he said, I don't place the implants, I restore them. Well, placing the damn implant a hundred times easier than restoring it on Lady Gaga's front tooth. If Lady Gaga told me to restore the first implant on her front tooth, I would just move to like Indonesia or China or uh, I would never come back. Uh, but the bottom line is, here's what I like about it. Clear liners and um, implants are growing double digits. I mean, you're, you're not talking twice the rate of growth in place. I mean, if the, the economy in the 20 richest countries in the world has been growing one and a half to 3% uh, since I got out of high school in 1980, implant, clear liners and implants are growing double digit growth rate. And I'll tell you another thing. When I was little, uh, we were Irish Catholic in Kansas. I had five sisters and a brother and every family, only the ugliest girl who would have to enter the nunnery uh, got braces. Dad was like, well, we got to fix up Emily or she's going to have to be a nun. Now, with birth control, the family's going from five to two, everybody gets ortho. And it's not just once. You get ortho first when you're, uh, maybe a pediatric dentist is going to do a rapid pellet expander. Then an orthodontist does your ortho. And then after your first divorce, you come back and get it again. And then when your husband dies, they, they take the, the, the uh, inheritance money and do it a four time. But I'll tell you what, my boys uh, had their mind blown. And let me tell you how irrational beauty is. Because first of all, if you're a girl, you're not ugly and need cosmetic dentistry. Just by definition, you're a girl, okay? And, um, but, I mean, we would be in, we'd be lecturing Cambodia, Vietnam, Asia, Hong Kong, and it'd be like the most beautiful little Asian girl, Chinese girl, whatever you ever seen. And she had Invisalign on, and I'm doing the numbers with her. I mean, it was like one-third of her income for two years is going to Invisalign. And, and we're looking at this, Perfectly beautiful girl and was saying, well, why did you do that? And they in Asia, they would hold their finger to their nose, to their chin. And if their lip uh, touched their chin, they wanted their upper bicuspids pulled and everything pulled back. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, we're in China. There's a billion, 300 million people. And there's not one boy 
in the entire country who cares that your lip touches your finger, but she's willing to spend, you know, uh, January, February, March, April, two years in a row to get two by custom full bust. So beauty, you know, you want to look like a peacock, fine, that's great. But my God, um, ortho is still rock bottom. I mean, you're going from just one kid out of six gets it. Now all kids get it. Now all kids get it once, twice, three times a lady. And my God, even in, uh, I've lectured, there's 58 countries in Africa and I've taken at least two or three or four of the boys that I've lectured in, I don't know, 10 or 20 of them. I mean, even in Africa, I mean, we were talking to this beautiful woman in uh, Tanzania and uh, she's spending her whole income on braces. And we're like, Okay, you're already so so this so so here's what I want you to do in baby dental school, um, and, and I can tell by your root canals. Huh? I can tell by your root canals in dental school. If you do your first root canal and you get all the way to the apex and a puff of sealer out the end, you're an apical barbarian and go blood and gut surgery. But if you like are trying to stop a half millimeter from the apex and get tugged back and 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 all that stuff. Go soft, pretty. Go bleaching, bonding, and and if and if you uh, seriously want to finish all your root canals a millimeter from the apex, you're not an endodontist. Be so you're either blood and guts apical barbarian, or you're soft and pretty, bleaching, bonding, Botox. I'm blood and guts, Stephen. I'm so glad there's people like you, Doctor D, and pediatric dentists, because. I would run from every one of your patients. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And if you ever want to put an online CE course or an article in Dental Town, I I would love to have it because it's the future. Implants, cosmetic dentistry, that's growing double digit. Don't forget that. That will be my pleasure. It was great hanging with you. Thank you for having me forget about the disaster that happened over the past four hours before this podcast with my veneer case. Uh, but it was a great night talking to you and I look forward to doing this again in the future. Yeah, I can't wait. That was Dr. Steven Davidowitz, DDS, AKA Dr. D at Luxury Dentistry, New York City. Thanks, buddy.